everyone. Our next guest is a woman who has had a lifelong love affair with pop culture. And she uses that as a lens to explore themes like family, identity, belonging, and grief. Here to talk about her new memoir, Superfan, How Pop Culture Broke My Heart, novelist and broadcaster Jen Sukfong Lee. Welcome to the show. Yay! <laughs> of your book and I'm just curious, what do you mean by pop culture broke your heart? Well, I think like when I was younger, I was always watching, you know, 80s television and listening to like 80s pop music and all of that stuff, trying to find ways to connect with the people that were doing the stuff. Um, and as I got older, I realized that I so rarely saw Asian women in popular media, in Western media. And as I got older, I totally understood that actually that stuff wasn't it precisely made for me and I wasn't actually mm. seeing myself. Mm. And that's kind of a grieving process when you're like, you know, I was like in my 30s really before I realized, wait a second, those people don't look like me. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you grew up in Vancouver, uh, immigrant parents, and you say that it was a world dominated by Western pop culture. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, you know, when I was growing up in East Vancouver, I grew up in a working class neighborhood and all the families were from all sorts of different places. Like my school classroom was oh, really oh, diverse. <laughs> oh, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> it's when I had good eyesight. Um, uh, my classroom was very diverse and all the families, you know, their houses, they, you know, smelled of different dishes and they did all different sorts of things. But then when I looked at the media, there really wasn't much that reflected sort of my everyday reality of like going to school and hanging out with all these kids. And you know, when we were little, we would ask each other, what are you? And it's a different oh. experience when you're a little kid asking that yeah. as opposed to like a grown adult. You should never ask that if you're a grown adult. <laughs> but as little kids, that was just how we sort of identified with each other and not seeing that on television or magazines or whatever was a really strange disconnect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've written uh, about your father's illness and how during that time you spent a lot of your time uh, reading Anne of Green Gables. So what, what was that phase of your life like? It was really lonely. My dad was sick for about four or five years and um, the year he got diagnosed was the year I first started reading Anne of Green Gables and she of course is an orphan who gets adopted. And I was facing a reality that my father might die and he did when I was 12. Mm. Um, and in the book, um, her adoptive father, Matthew, Anne's uh, yeah. adoptive father, Matthew dies. And when he dies, he says to her, I wouldn't trade you for a dozen boys. And in our household, uh, I have four older sisters, no brothers at all, uh, and the idea that a girl could be so valuable to a father was really something I needed to hear. Mm -hmm. And I really needed to see another kid going through grief and loss. Because I was, you know, 12 years old. It was a new experience. Other little kids had not had that happen. So it was, yeah, it was really important. Oh my God, I love that. Yeah. Um, you described your intimacy with fandom as a need to feel connected to people you've never met. And did, did it somehow define your relationship with your father's memory? Yeah, for sure, because like I was so young when he died and I don't really remember him being healthy. And so I have these memories and it's really hard for me to know if my memories are actual memories yeah. or if it's just the stories my mom told me or my sisters told me. Um, and I think a lot of what I think about my father, I've probably made up. And it's mm -hmm. that same way, you know, if, if you're in love with Keanu Reeves, which who who is not, That's right. uh, that is we're correct. making that relationship up in our heads. Really, yeah. no, we're not, no. Yeah. He loves us he all. Loves us. Yeah. <laughs> he loves us. I, you know, you had to process a lot of grief, um, not only from the loss of your father, but your mother went through a bit of depression and then your sisters moved out. So how was it that you found solace in the artist Bob Ross during that yeah. time? Yeah. Well, first of all, his voice. Doesn't that make everybody's yeah. scalp feel good and yeah. tingly? Um, you know, I really needed a nurturing sort of fatherly figure in those long years after my father had died. But the wonderful thing about Bob Ross is he paints a little, then he looks at the camera and he says, this tree needs a friend. It's just a happy little accident. It's all gonna turn out fine. And you're like, yes, Bob, thank you for turning to the camera and saying that directly to me. That's right. Yes. He's speaking yes. to you. Yes. I love it. And beautiful paintings, not to mention they're gorgeous. You, you also write about uh, Princess Diana and, and how you felt like she wasn't just a good girl. How did you relate to her? It's so funny, no one ever thinks like, why would a Chinese Canadian girl in East Vancouver care about Princess Diana? But there was something about her, I think from the very beginning, that showed that she wasn't doing or being the kind of princess probably the British royal family wanted. We all know now they probably wanted something else. But as her life went on and she actually rejected that role, um, it was a real eye opener for me because there's no greater burden of respectability than being an actual princess. Yeah. And she said no. Yeah. And I thought, wow, so all this good behavior that I'm supposed to adhere to 
does it matter anymore? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I love wow. that. Wow. Another popular figure that you wrote about in the book is Rihanna. Uh, what did you learn like from watching her career? Like everything, because she's everything. <laughs> yes. uh, but also, like one of my favorite things about her is that whenever she leaves a restaurant, she's always holding a glass of red wine or like or like a tumbler <laughs> of scotch or whatever. See, and she's doing that. And she like takes the glass we're out with her, and I can just imagine her saying, "Well, I paid for it. I can walk out with it." And I'm like, "Wait, what else can I do that I haven't been doing? And how good would my life be if she would just tell me what to do?" <laughs> well, we gotta ask, what are you obsessed with right now in pop culture? Um, you know, I'm really interested in who Kim Kardashian dates next. That's like my big. <laughs> Any predictions? Cory Booker is single. Cory Booker is single. You, you're suggesting Kim Kardashian and Cory Booker. Yeah. <laughs> People are gasping. Yeah. No, it makes sense. Think about it. I just want you to think about it for two seconds. She's got money. She's got reach. He's a mm -hmm. politician. He smiles a lot. I think he'd be great with the kids. <laughs> you have something here. Yeah. Jenna like that. Yeah. What do you think is the, or what do you hope is the biggest takeaway from this book for your readers? I would really hope that whatever culture people are into, it could be anything, it could be Love is Blind, it could be Mark Rothko paintings, whatever it is. Yeah. I would hope that people are a bit more thoughtful about why they like something because it helps us understand who we are, why we love something, what our old little traumas are, what um, our loves and joys and challenges are, but I think if we're really thoughtful about how we're consuming the culture, it would make everything a lot better. Our conversations would be more deeper. I think we'd think more deeply about every decision we made, and I think that would solve a lot of problems, frankly. You just reminded me that one time I had a, a messy breakup, I, and somehow I related to Indiana Jones during that time. Sure. I can't explain it right now, but it meant a great deal to me, <laughs> and it got me through a tough time. Right, his whip, his fedora, it all meant something. <laughs> it all meant something. I'm gonna reach over. We can't thank you enough for being here. Thank you oh, so much again. You. The book is called Super Fan: How Pop Culture Broke My Heart, and it's out today. Audience, you're all going home with your own copy. <laughs> there. Wasn't that great? Do you know where you can find some equally good content? Our YouTube page. It's filled with discussions, debates, and some laughs. Head there now. Like and subscribe.